All right, Progressive Era Part 2, Changing Ideas of Freedom. Let's go. So we're talking about the Progressive Era, and, and we need to get some terms clear. If in 2017, 2018, I say progressive, you're going to think of a certain set of um, liberal ideas. Things like um, affordable college education, things like strengthening the safety net, things like rights for LGBTQ or equal rights for women, those types of things. At the turn of the 20th century, uh, progressive meant other things. Again, they mean moving forward, they mean progress. Some of those things are still part of it, but there are other things that are, that are mixed into it. In other words, anything that is a, a change from the status quo is considered to be uh, progressive at this particular point. And one of those uh, varieties of progressivism, of course, is the labor movement. Uh, we celebrate Labor Day to celebrate the victories of the labor, labor movement. You have the weekend. You have an, the limit of an eight-hour day. You have the, uh, the notions of paid vacation, the notions of employer-provided health care. These came out of uh, the labor movement, which, like I said, is why we celebrate Labor Day. As this is coming at the same time as the rise of the second industrial revolution, as this is coming with, as we are industrializing, as we are urbanizing, uh, there are there are talks about industrial democracy, industrial freedom. How how does how do the concepts of freedom and democracy apply to this new world? Issues of uh, joint action of unionism they become important enough that by the 1912 campaign Eugene V. Debs is actually able to run on the Socialist Party uh, uh, ticket and although he doesn't carry any states he makes enough of an impact as most third parties will do uh, think of Jill Stein to um, essentially uh, sway the election but it is in the teens um, prior to the Russian Revolution prior to 1917 um, it is in the, the 19 teens that we are at the high watermark for the Socialist Party in this country. Uh, currently, the Democratic Socialist Party is growing like crazy. But, uh, and, and again, these are similar situations. We're in the second Gilded Age. We were in the first Gilded Age. Now we're in the second one. Socialism, as a response to the rule by the elites, by the 1%, the ideas of socialism, the ideas of sharing profits, the ideas of having a, 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 a say in in how your workplace is run and how in, in, in how your work is organized, uh, these things become important uh, as a as a counter to what's going on in the in the broader society. And so you see the Socialist Party in the teens making significant inroads. Um, many of these are calling for nationalization of the railroads and of factories, in other words, the places where people work, turning those into uh, things owned by the people, and that the economy should be much more heavily uh, controlled by uh, the government. And just as an indication as to how uh, successful the Socialist Party was, this is in the 19-teens. If you look at all those little blue dots, those are communities in which um, Socialists, members of the Socialist Party, not Democratic Socialists, not Democrats who lean socialist, but actual, um, an actual focus, uh, an actual member of the Socialist Party was elected mayor in all of those blue dots. And this echoes what's going on in Europe. Now, we begin to see uh, throughout the Atlantic world. And now, as we enter this first phase of the really successful aspects of, of the labor movement, one of the first big... Uh, probably the biggest, and still today the biggest uh, of, of all the unions, is this umbrella union that we call the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL. It will later uh, merge with the CIO and become the AFL-CIO, which is uh, the largest um, private sector labor union we continue to have in this country. One of the things that sets the AFL apart from some of the others, like the International Workers of the World, or the uh, some of the other earlier, um, much more radical much more Marxist uh, unions is that this is much more uh, moderate in its ideology. Uh, it sees its role as a partner with management. It sets up the notion that if the uh, unions hurt, if the workers hurt the company too much, they're not going to have a job anyway. And so there's a certain level of condescension that is allowed where it, it's a junior position, but it is a position uh, of labor coming to the business and saying, we're in this together. 
this does allow for the beginning of collective bargaining for what were considered to be responsible unions. Uh, and it actually does a lot to break down some of the anti-unionist feelings of many of the largest employers because here's a union that is willing to work with you as opposed to always being adversarial. Um, do they make the gains? Ultimately, they make a lot of gains. Do they make all of the gains that they wanted to? N no, but that's what democracy and compromise and, and negotiation and all that stuff is all about. You get some of what you want, I get some of what I want, and then together we're both better off. Uh, this girl is probably about 11 or 12. Um, the reason that her one arm is hanging to her side is that it is paralyzed uh, due to an industrial accident. She's working in one of the mills. Um, these are all done by Lewis Hine, who uh, I, I, I've shown you some cityscapes, but really where he, he really is America's first photojournalist. Uh, he's taking pictures of these people. These are not portraits in the formal sense. These are, he's taking pictures of the common man, of the, of the worker in the world. You, you see on the left side of your screen, uh, you see a, uh, these are breaker boys. They work, in, they work in Pennsylvania coal mines, and these are, are uh, young lads that are, are pushing or pulling small carts through tunnels too, too small to stand up in, um, basically to pull the stuff out of the, out of the mines. One of the uh, most successful aspects of the early progressive movement is the elimination of child labor. Um, at the same time, as we enter the 20th century, there's a change in, in art. Photography actually pushes a change. Um, prior to the 20th century, or the end of the 19th century, most art was either landscapes, it was nature, landscapes, still lifes, or important people, or portraits, uh, if they weren't important people, we know who those people are. We know who uh, the Magi was. We know who Mona Lisa was, or we're pretty sure. We know who those, those recognizable portraits are. And there are always people who can pay, afford to pay for them. We get to the 20th century, and partly because of photography, and partly just because of the, the changes in the modern world, regular people become subjects. And so here you see, this is uh, Hester Street. It's a painting from 1905 from George Lux. And he, again, is part of this Ashcan school of urban artists. They capture street life. They capture the, the trash cans and, the, and all of this stuff. So um, we begin to, to focus less on the big things of, 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 of history. And the, one of the things of the modern age of the 20th century is that the individual becomes important. Normally when I show this photograph in, in class, I'll say, what do you see here? And it usually takes a few minutes and people are a little reticent to, to answer. But what you do see here is you see a policeman and several bystanders looking up and several other, other bystanders looking at the, the bodies of these dead women on, on the ground here. And this is uh, probably one of the deadliest industrial disasters in the history of, of the city of New York. Uh, it happened on March 25th, 1911, and this is essentially the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Um, and what you see here is the dead bodies of women who have leapt from the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor windows of a building that's on fire. Even though New York City had fire standards, they had to have fire uh, extinguishers, they had to have uh, uh, different... Um, uh, exit paths in case of a fire. Um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, which employed only women, uh, it is an early sweatshop. Uh, it, uh, the management felt that the women were uh, abusing things like coming in late, maybe leaving a few minutes early, maybe sneaking out on the fire escapes to have a cigarette during the day. In other words, they weren't getting 10 hours of straight work out of these women. And so they began locking the doors, if you weren't there on time, you didn't get in, uh, you couldn't leave early, and you couldn't get out to the fire escapes because you weren't at your station actually working. Uh, and you have to understand there are, no, there, there are no federal safety regulations. There are a few fire regulations in New York because they'd had several ugly fires and they'd set up uh, precautionary measures to try to prevent it from happening again. But with no federal safety requirements. It's up to each, each uh, individual locality to set their own. And you can set standards, but if you don't have the, the money to enforce them, then people will take advantage. 
Um, this is the whole idea behind, oh, well, we don't, we will let, we'll let people self-regulate. They don't. Um, capitalism will always go for the profit. It will, you are not, as an employee, important. Management locked the fire escapes, locked the, the other. Now, in a textile factory, in many types of manufacturing, there are lots of different types of hazards. And over the years, we've found ways, uh, usually be almost always because of government regulation requiring it, to eliminate some of those hazards. And in textile factories, even in sewing rooms, um, what happens is a lot of lint gets, uh, escapes into the air. And when the lint reaches a certain density in the air, you have essentially fuel. Uh, if you're using gaslight, this is why many factories used to only be during daylight hours. If you're using gaslight, you have an open flame. If the air gets saturated with a fuel and the, the combination of oxygen and fuel are sufficient, it will combust. And this is what happened uh, in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Was the, 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 three level, the three floors of the factory caught fire. The women were unable to escape. Some of them finally broke windows that they couldn't get to the fire escapes. And so they literally jumped to their deaths. We saw this during the, the um, um, uh, World Trade Center where people were jumping off of you know, hundreds of floors because they would rather die uh, hitting the concrete than being burnt to death. This is actually a, um, a sweatshop. This is similar to what you, we would have uh, experienced. Uh, this is from a few years later. You see these are electric lights, but th this is the kind of place that the women in the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory would have been working. One of the more interesting unions that grew up at this time is the Industrial Workers of the World, or the IWW, often referred to as the Wobblies. This was a, a fascinating uh, union in that it was much more radical than the FFL, the CIO, or any of the other, uh, even in the, night, the earlier Knights of Labor. It was inclusive. If you had a job, you qualified as a member. This employed everything from school teachers to lumberjacks, from waitresses to bus drivers. And it didn't matter if you were male or female, if you were Jewish, if you were black, if you were white. It, 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 essentially, it was totally inclusive. It also is probably the closest and, and most um, militant, uh, closest to uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto. They even get their uh, uh, slogan, you know, Workers of the World Unite, comes. it's the last line of the, the Communist Manifesto. So they're very much a Marxist union. Uh, they're much more militant than any of the other unions. They're very much into a revolution, not necessarily an armed revolution, but a revolution from uh, from below. Uh, at this point in history, it's run by Big Bill Hayward. Uh, and again, this is, is really an inclusive union. It goes across boundaries. It goes across races, across genders, across industries. Uh, and it really does support and, and lead some of the earliest large mass multi-ethnic strikes here in the United States. There are a couple of, of uh, high water marks that we want to talk about. The Bread and Roses textile strike, uh, the March of the, 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 the uh, Workers' Children. I'll show you those in a minute. Peterson Silk Workers' Strike, uh, the uh, Colorado Fuel and, Isle Fuel and Iron Miners' Strike. And really, this uh, comes in during a time when uh, the government is on the side of the of the manufacturers of the of the of the industrialists, where anytime there's a strike, there's, it's really ambiguous what the rights of strikers are, and it begins at the early the first two decades of the 20th century. We begin to start seeing things like the ability to organize a union as a civil liberty, the ability to strike as a civil civil liberty, and it is. Um, really the foundation of where we got to where we are today. The Lawrence Bread and Roses strike was in 1912, and this is uh, there was a strike going on in, in Lawrence. This is a, a, a area of, of uh, primarily textile mills. Um, and the Wobblies read, uh, led a strike, and it really wasn't getting very far. Now, all social movements of all stripes over the years have discovered that there are three things they must do. The first is to protest. People must be made aware of the problem. Then you attack existing laws, you litigate, and then you create new laws, you legislate. But the first step is to protest. Well, you could protest out in, in Lowell, Lowell, Massachusetts all you wanted to, and no one would see it. So they actually literally moved the strike, uh, or the, the, the uh, appearance of the strike, uh, the public face of the strike to New York City, where they had this this uh, huge parade, and basically what they did is they took the workers' children, and um, 
took them out and put them in the uh, in, into the parade so you could see who was being impacted uh, by the strike, by the conditions of the of their parents working in the factories, and um, it was referred to as the bread and roses strike, the strike for three loaves. It was uh, essentially a um, uh, a way to do that first part, make the protests public so that people became aware of the strike. And this is uh, this is what it looked like at home. This is back at Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, these are. Um, uh, on the one side of the screen, you see the strikers, the parents of those children you just saw in the parade. And on the other side, you see the National Guard, the state militia at that time. Um, and you see the, the workers carrying flags. I mean, many of these are immigrants. Many of these are recent Americans. They're very, very patriotic. On the other side, you see the government, the U.S. and the state government, essentially with fixed bayonets and live ammunition ready at any point to mow this, this group down. And we see many, many people uh, killed in, in these strikes in the early days. Um, this is a, also, while we're talking about garment workers, this is in New York City in 1913. And the reason I show this picture is I want you to notice all of the different languages. This, this really, I think, illustrates the uh, issues surrounding immigration at the turn of the 20th century, um, the turn into the 20th century, in that um, all these recent immigrants, they come from many, many places. You'll see Italian and Yiddish and, and Spanish and um, German and all kinds of different languages here on these protest signs because these, these are the workers. This is uh, who our, our workers actually are at this point. I do want to talk just a moment about um, other changes that are happening. And this is really the beginning of feminism. This is the appearance of the term feminism. This is the beginning of that term. And it's used primarily because the women's movement had started in the 19th century alongside abolition of slavery. And women saw their status and the status of slaves as, as synonymous. Uh, they were both property. They had, very, they had no rights of their own. Uh, they were tied to the, the, uh, the rights of a white male. And so up until the, up through the Civil War, up through parts of Reconstruction, these two uh, movements are, are linked together. With the passage of the 15th Amendment, which gives the rights to all adult males, the rights to vote to all adult males, excluding women, there creates a division in, in these two movements. And over the next several decades, uh, the, the women's movement is trying to figure out where it fits. And in the early teens and 20s, they, they, they change their tack just a little bit. And we have what's called the first wave of feminism. And the reason it's called feminism is because these are women who want to remain women. They want the, uh, they, they, they're saying, look, we still will be mothers. We still will be wives. We just want to be an equal partner. We don't want to be uh, at the same status as our children that are the property of, uh, of, of the, the male head of the household. This also comes at the time of what's often referred to as the lyrical left. Um, and I have here Isadora Duncan, who is a, a, a dancer, a modern dancer at the turn of the century, who interpreted things like poetry, uh, social commentary, the status of women or minorities, and she, she interpreted them through modern dance. And this is really part of the, the, this, I mean, we'll see this in the 50s, we'll see this in the 60s with the, the uh, Bohemians, the, the, uh, the, the hep cats, and then the hipsters, and then the hippies, um, different than the hipsters of the, of the teens and 20s of, uh, of, of, of this century. Um, but this is a period of, of radical reassessment of politics, of arts, of sexuality, of, of, of the relationship of the family, the relationship of, of marriage. All of these things are being reassessed at this particular point. And, and I, I'd like to show this picture. This is a piece of sheet music. In the old days, you had a hit by selling lots of sheet music. People didn't play their iPad or their, you know, their, 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 uh, their playlist, they played an instrument. They, whether they played a guitar or a banjo or a piano or a trumpet or a whatever, people made music instead of listened to music. And, the, this is a, a, and so the, you had hit songs by selling sheet music. There was no such thing as recorded music until a little bit later. And so uh, this is a song. Uh, the song is called The Only Thing I Ask of You. Uh, and it was a, a popular song around about 1910, 1911. And I, I love the, the, uh, the, the, the picture that's used here because you see a blackboard. And she's taking out the words obey. She's leaving love and honor. And this really defines 
the concepts of early feminism is that there's still going to be women. They're still going to, to assume the majority of those gendered roles. They just wanted the rights to be able to own their own property, to make their own decisions, to make their own decisions about their body, and to vote. And this is happening at the same time that, that really two big movements are, are, are reaching popular um, popularity. Uh, they're, 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 they're in the popular press as opposed to being just in, in the academic uh, world. And that is uh, Darwinism and uh, the, the concepts of evolution and Freudian psychology, which most of Freud has been uh, determined to be bogus by today's standards, but it, at the time uh, it was very important and it was a big part of um, popular conceptions. And at the same time that we're seeing the rise of this first wave of feminism, we're beginning to see pockets of open gay culture, to be gay at this particular point in, in uh, our history, to be gay, to be uh, bisexual, to be um, um, transsexual or tra uh, transgendered. Uh, all of these things are uh, illegal. And so you're only seeing, in and usually in urban areas, concentrated and only somewhat open gay cultures uh, with, with um, gay bars and uh, bathhouses and uh, other things like that that are starting to get things moving a little bit. But women are a huge focus of the progressive era in that many of the progress progressive proclivities, the things that are motivating people to try to help, uh, especially the poor, um, are focused on women. If the husband is coming home drunk and beating the wives or, or, or drinking away the paycheck, then you eliminate alcohol. That protects the women and the children. Uh, one of the ways that um, women are, are viewed differently at this particular point is, is really comes out of Emma Goldman and Margaret Sanger, and that is the, the notion of making birth control available to everyone. Now, we've practiced birth control, whether it was through condoms or whether it was through spermicidal, uh, either jellies or, or lotions or, or whatever, or whether it was through using herbs or you name it. We've been practicing contraception uh, basically since we were living in, in huts and making tools out of, of uh, uh, obsidian or, or uh, other uh, crystalline substances. We've always known what made babies. We've always known how uh, uh, to prevent it, and we've always practiced that. But in the modern world, it becomes even more important to consider uh, uh, reproductive health because we no longer need tons of babies to work the farm. We, uh, and, and with the, the, the removal of child labor laws, we no longer need children to bring home an income. They actually become a, a drain on resources. And so there, people like Emma Goldman and Margaret Sanger are looking at the, these poor women with many, many babies. And if birth control could be made, made uh, uh, accessible for them, then that would help alleviate the problem. Now, Margaret Sanger is often referred to as, as a racist because she's trying to, to cut down on the number of the undesirable babies. That's true. Um, and of course, she's the founder of, of Planned Parenthood. That's exactly true. She looked at these uh, uh, lower classes, immigrants, people of, uh, of non-white races, and, and saw that there were just being so many of them that it was going to damage com the, the, the communities at large, and society itself would be impacted by this large influx of poor, uh, poorly educated, uh, unhealthy uh, uh, people in poverty, and they just happen to be members of non-white races. Although there are a lot of poor white people as well, but Sanger was looking at how to, to deal with problems of race and immigration uh, by limiting the population. I mentioned Emma Goldman before. She was uh, one of these feminists who was involved in lots and lots of different uh, aspects of the progressive movement. And so here you see, this is the Scandinavia Hall. This is in uh, um, uh, Portland, Oregon. And you can see she's giving a, a series of talks over the course of uh, a couple of weeks here. Uh, actually, it's the course of about a week. And she's talking about anarchism. She's talking about Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a very popular televangelist, kind of the Joel Olstein of his age. Uh, and she's, she's talking about, uh, she's, she's arguing against much of what he's preaching, but she's talking here about how the media is giving uh, these voices a very, very strong 
uh, outlet. Uh, the misconceptions of free love, that it's not just everybody go screw everybody, that it's really, you know, that, that, that it, it has, uh, that the, the notion of free love is that you, if you want to be with someone, you be with that person. If you don't, you don't. Um, that's, uh, again, women are still property at this point. There's no such thing as spousal rape. There's no such thing as, as a woman being able to say no. Uh, 99% of, the, of, of uh, rapes go unreported because there's no point. Um, it, 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 there, there really are, is no point in pursuing it. And so women are, are, you know, they are property. She addresses Nietzsche. She addresses uh, things like personal relationships, jealousy, um, Probably the the biggest destroyer of relationships is, is is jealousy, but that's this is a history class, so we won't go into that. Uh, anarchism in literature again, birth control, why and how small families are desirable. The in, in intermediate sex, a discussion on homosexuality, trying to to grasp at a period where we didn't have any real research, where we had real no understand no real understanding of of how um, sexuality works. And, uh, but she's trying to address these in, in this, I believe this is 1910, 1911, 1912, somewhere right around there. Um, war on the sacred right of, of property uh, and the variety or monogamy, which, and again, these are, are, are uh, just as today, if you know anyone who's active in, in social movements, you'll find that they're usually active in, in more than one movement at a time. In a face-to-face -face class, I've asked my students, what's going on here? So the number one, this is New York. This is 1908. Uh, but what is going on here? And, and uh, I get all kinds of, of, of answers, but I'll just tell you. Uh, this is actually a visiting nurse. And what she's doing is uh, she is in one of these very poor neighborhoods. She's probably from um, uh, one of the, uh, either the, city or county agencies or more likely a private nonprofit agency dealing with health care and she is making rounds of poor people in this neighborhood and th there are very few of these buildings that are four five six stories tall at this particular time had elevators now you can't build a, a building more than, than uh, one floor without an elevator if it's a public public accommodation you have to provide them well they didn't exist then and so what she has done is she has gone up the stairs to the top floor and then to the roof in one building and now she's climbing over the dividing wall between the two buildings to get to the next building where she will then go down the stairs and start at the top floor and work her way down uh, to the street and again you see that there are lots and lots of different ways to approach the ideas of this progressive era and I'm going to end this section with this, this photograph. This is not a colored photograph. This is a hand-tinted photograph. So you'll see that um, uh, people have often pointed to a couple of these women and said, oh, they're women of color in here. No, they were just women in the shadows. And when they put the, the watercolor over the shadow, it, it just made it kind of dark. Uh, these are all white women. These are all white middle-class women. But this is really the definition of the feminist uh, push at the f in the first two decades of the, the the 20th century, yes, we're going. We want votes, but look, we're still mothers. We still have we have our babies here. We're still dressing pretty. I know these are these are hot outfits for the time. This is this is basically a spandex and a tube top. Um, <laughs> uh, these are are uh, very feminine women, and this is is again the 1912 women's suffrage parade, uh, New York City. And it again, it is that notion that feminists are equals, but they're still women. That 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 gen those gendered roles still remain. And that wraps up part two, and we'll be back again next time with uh, the final part of the progressive era.